Kelly Zuniga, CEO of Holocaust Museum Houston. And tonight is a really, really special honor for us because we're hosting Civil Liberties, a community discussion with a very, very distinguished panel of leaders this evening. And uh, we also have an exceptional moderator, too, who I'll be introducing in just a moment. But to, for those that are in the back, um, just to start from my far right, uh, the organizations that are being represented this evening are Holocaust Museum Houston, Texas League of United Latin American Citizens, Emerge USA, unfortunately, is not going to be here this evening. He was called to Austin. Oh, no, I'm sorry, he's, he's not there. It's Equality Texas that will not be there. I'm so, I'm just, I apologize. Emerge USA Texas is here. Um, also, uh, the Japanese American Citizens League Houston Chapter and the Anti-Defamation League, as well as the American Civil Liberties Union of Texas. We also have the NAACP Houston branch with us this evening as well. So our moderator this evening is Tracy Chaperon. And Tracy, we're very, very fortunate because she is also on our board of trustees at Holocaust Museum Houston. She's the president and CEO of Vision, which is a live event and video production company specializing in immersive experiences and content creation. And she was named as one of the top 100 producers in America. She has exceptional experience in production movie design, video, and for special events. And one of the things that she just recently completed in um, an incredible fashion is that she was a member of the Houston Super Bowl host committee and did a lot of the video work uh, for the Super Bowl. She also does work for the Rockets as well as the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo on a regular basis. Um, she is going to be leading this evening as our moderator and uh, she'll also be uh, organizing the question and answer period following our discussion. So I wanted to especially thank Tracy for doing this this evening and please uh, join me in a warm welcome to her as well as our panelists this evening. Thank you so much. welcoming city for all. We are going to have a very important discussion together tonight on civil liberties. And we owe it to ourselves and our loved ones and our community to really understand our freedoms and our rights. And it's so confusing and complicated. Uh, it's, there's human rights and civil rights and civil liberties and there's so much inaccurate information out there and so many differing opinions about what is right and what is wrong. Plus you have to navigate all the politics and all the legalities of our court system and our constitution and the Bill of Rights and amendments and not to mention this crazy challenging world we are living in right now and so much political discord. The road to what is right and what is just is not easy, and it's also really long. Think about it, the Constitution, the supreme uh, law of the land, was written 230 years ago. From a very limited view. <laughs> Think about it, for example, African Americans weren't even considered citizens back then. It would take 78 years to abolish slavery, 133 years for women to have the right to vote, and 228 years to have the right to marry the one you love. <clears throat> Community discussions like this one are so essential to educate us on the issues so that we can together work on positive impact or affect positive change towards a more inclusive and respectful society. I am honored to serve on the board of Holocaust Museum Houston and to chair their Marketing and Communications Committee. 
I believe in their mission, and I will do whatever it takes to help move that mission forward. And tonight is an example of that. So, we have a lot to talk about. Let's get started. But well, we, we have an amazing panel to hear from, but we also want to hear from you. So when you came in, you were all given some index cards and something to write with. So please jot down any questions you may have and um, pass it on down to the aisle. Uh, the Holocaust Museum staff is going to come up and down every once in a while and grab those for you from you, and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. But right now, let's give it up for our amazing panelists. Please help me out. So we're going to start with everybody taking about a minute to introduce themselves and their organizations and the communities that they represent. And Mary Lee, we'll start with you at the end because Holocaust Museum Houston is hosting us this evening and thank you for doing so. Wonderful. And I'm, and I'm going to use the microphone. Anna, I'm going to use the microphone. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So, civil liberties concern basic rights and freedoms that are guaranteed either explicitly or identified by the Bill of Rights in the Constitution or interpreted by courts of law and citizens through the years um, and through lawmakers. In the United States today, civil liberties are generally thought to include the freedom of speech, the right to privacy, and are you recognizing these as part of our Bill of Rights? I hope so. Um, the right to be free from unreasonable searches, the right to fair court trial, the right to marry, the right to vote. And tonight, we are also, I know, thinking about the liberties that we have come to expect and that we dream to further, such as those relating to asylum seekers and refugees. Um, Holocaust Museum Houston teaches the history of the Holocaust and its relevance and importance today. The loss of civil liberties in Germany after the Reichstag fire was one of the ways that the Nazis cemented their power, their rise to power. And this connection draws our attention. As our colleagues at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum recently said in response to challenges to civil liberties today, the Holocaust did not start with killing. It started with words. And I think, from my perspective, that the Holocaust started with words and the things that those words incited. Um, in the aftermath of the moral and societal failures that made the Holocaust possible, confronting hatred in its myriad forms is critical. For example, history has shown us that whenever anti-Semitism has gone unchecked, soon after comes the persecution of others, um, not far behind. Defeating hatred must be a cause that we take on of great importance for people who value humanity and injustice. In a democracy, as Tracy mentioned, um, it is a great challenge to balance our civil liberties, our rights, and our responsibilities. And I know that we're all going to be thinking about that. And I also offer my welcome and my pleasure to be here representing Holocaust Museum Houston. Thank you. I guess we'll go around the line. Augustine, you want to Oh, yeah. I'll give this to him. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. It's a great privilege to be here with you tonight. I see people like the Congressman Green and a lot of Can I raise this? Hello? Testing? Bueno, bueno. No, yeah. <laughs> hey, my name is Agustin Pinedo. Uh, I'm uh, known as Augie. Uh, I'm, uh, I represent Lula. I'm uh, one of ten uh, community members that uh, represent civil rights throughout the state of Texas. We have a director and we have a committee of ten. I'm, uh, I represent the, the Houston region. And the next uh, person would be Corpus Christi. And the uh, next one will be San Antonio. So we have a pretty uh, large uh, area that we represent. And uh, LULAC started uh, approximately 87 years ago, uh, 88, in 1929. And it uh, started because uh, of rampant racism 
kind of like you see now. And uh, right ab after the, the, uh, the war with Mexico, after Texas uh, was uh, stripped away and, and annexed, there ensued a, a period of, uh, of racism against uh, Mexican Americans. Uh, the laws were changed to strip Mexicans of their land. A lot of people that had been there for generations lost their land. That's why you have uh, huge ranches like the King Ranch that are thousands of miles per miles large because a lot of that land was taken from Mexican Americans. There were a record number of lynchings back then. Uh, some scholars say there were perhaps more than, than the African Americans suffered uh, in, in, in the South. I'm not saying they suffered less, but or hanged or lynchings because there, there was, you know, they, they wanted to keep the land. And so it, it, uh, a period of uh, lawlessness against Mexicans uh, started right after that. And, and uh, along came uh, LULAC in 1929 to address some of those issues. Still, it was really bad. There were a lot of signs in, in businesses, uh, no dogs or Mexicans allowed. And uh, sometimes they weren't willing to let dogs in, but it was certainly no Mexicans. And uh, there was even a case of uh, this veteran uh, that was killed in the war, and they wouldn't allow him to be buried in the local cemetery. It was that bad. So uh, under that uh, xenophobia and uh, racism, that's when it started. And uh, in the next 10 years, LULAC did a lot uh, to um, integrate the businesses and institutions. And it's continued to do, uh, I think, a, a great job um, it, uh, LULAC uh, not only addresses uh, civil rights, but also very strong in education. Uh, it started, uh, early on, it started the School of the 400, which was a, a school, uh, the idea was to teach children going to elementary school 400 words, 400 keywords. Because keep in mind, they came from, from a Spanish-speaking only home. Uh, 400 essential words. And it proved so successful that uh, Later on, it became the Head Start program. Ever heard of the Head Start program? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's national now. And that's how uh, successful it was. It, it later, the government founded it, uh, and it became uh, national in scope. It serves everybody now. And then uh, later, we uh, LULAC started a set jobs for progress. We felt there was a need uh, to help people find employment and, and, uh, and training and whatnot. And uh, we started that, and it became mainstream. Broke away, now it's in 48 states. So it, it, it's everywhere. We have one here. Uh, and then we started the LNESC, uh, LULAC National Education Services. And uh, that's uh, to provide grants and, uh, and scholarships to thousands of students uh, throughout the United States. Uh, annually, we, we give uh, well over a million dollars. Uh, you know, a million dollars is not that much anymore. But it, it certainly has helped a lot of students uh, go to, sc to school. And then we have MALDEF, that's the Mexican American Legal Defense Fund. Uh, that uh, The need was perceived to have a, a pool of lawyers that would address issues of civil rights. And that's what it is. It's based in San Antonio, and it's been tackling some of the, uh, the, the problem areas around here. They, they just uh, uh, tackled uh, Pasadena. I, I probably heard that, that the, the city council there wanted to go from single district to two districts at large. They wanted to fix it so, so the uh, Anglo population would win and, and keep the, the same people in, in city council that have been there for a long time. Well, I see, I need to interrupt, but we've got such a short period amount of time oh, and so many people to get to. We could spend the whole evening on your amazing accomplishments. Okay, well, I'll, I'll wind it up and I'll save some for the other questions. <laughs> Let's keep going. Please introduce yourself and very briefly tell us about uh, your, your organization you represent in the community. Thank you. Um, my name is Nadila Masur. I'm with Emerge USA, and we are a nonpartisan organization and we represent the NASA community. And the NASA community is, um, really comprises the Muslim, South Asian, and Arab community. Muslims are a really small part of America. We comprise about two and a half million entire country, about 1% of the nation. But what we found is that we are being used as a political tool um, in political rhetoric 
this past election cycle um, quite a lot. And so there was a need perceived for us to organize in a way where we can stand up for those rights. And so Emerge USA was around before the election, but our work has taken on an urgency that we just haven't seen before. And we have chapters throughout this, like the country. We have seven chapters right now. We're, um, we also have our executive director who resides in, in DC, working on, on, on making sure that we get the, the actions, the legislation we need to do to protect vulnerable communities. And so we're here in Houston, we're working within the Muslim community to educate them and let them know that they have the right to be here and then they have the right to stand up for, for, their, for, for their American uh, American rights just as everyone else. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done in our community, but I think the excitement is there and, um, and people are really open to listen. And so it's a privilege to be here with all these other great organizations. Thank you so much. Gary? Good evening. My name is Gary Nakamura. I'm the immediate past president of the Japanese American Citizens League, uh, Houston chapter. Um, we represent JSO members and activities here in the state of Texas. Um, JSO, for those of uh, you who are not familiar with us, um, we're, uh, we were founded in 1929, I guess 1929 was a good year since the left was also founded. Um, we have 103 chapters nationwide with over 12,000 members, uh, making us the lar oldest and largest Asian American civil rights organization in the country. Um, we've been involved with civil rights issues um, from you know, very early on, especially after World War II, as I think, I hope most of you know, um, the sad legacy of the Japanese American community is that, uh, you know, uh, over 97% of us were uprooted from our West Coast homes and forcibly um, put into, incarcerated into camps during World War II including my late father and his entire family. So I have a personal um, motivation, um, and that's really why I've been involved in civil rights issues, especially for the Asian American community. Uh, but JCL, we do advocate not only for Japanese Americans, but for all Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. And, uh, and I'm so glad that we're actually finally getting together this evening with a, a wonderful group of um, community leaders I'm hoping that this is a great first step for us to continue to meet on a regular basis so that we can continue to form relationships and uh, be able to call upon each other whenever we need uh, to support each other. Thank you. Founded in 1913, the ADL's mission has been twofold, with the first part stopping anti-Semitism and defending the Jewish people. And the second part, just as important, securing justice and fair treatment for all. Today, it means fighting threats to our very democracy, including attacks on our civil rights, cyber hate, bullying, bias in schools and the criminal justice system, terrorism, hate crimes, coercion of religious minorities, contempt for anyone who's different, and, but as well as standing up for immigration and refugee rights. My name is Ian Sharp, and I'm the immediate past board chair of ADL Southeast Region and also the National Commissioner. Our region, based in Houston, extends to almost all of South Texas, including Houston, Beaumont, San Antonio, Corpus Christi, and El Paso. There are two other regional offices in Texas, which are in Austin and Dallas. Our role in the community takes on many forms of not only fighting anti Semitism, hate, and discrimination but also in working with other religious and ethnic communities on the security of our religious institutions, partnering with law enforcement to identify and prosecute hate crimes and other <coughs> extremist activities, as well as standing up for Israel when it is under attack from thinly veiled anti-Semitic attitudes. ADL's No Place for Hate program is in over 400 schools in our region and growing, helping foster and cultivate an educational environment where children respect and embrace each other's differences while rejecting bias and belief. ADL builds bridges between communities of faith and ethnicity and advances interfaith dialogue through its robust coalition of mutual respect that includes partners throughout our community. ADL is also active in community advocating for the religious freedom for all religions so that individuals are free to exercise their religious beliefs, be free from the coercion of another religion on their beliefs or rights, or to just not express or hold any religious beliefs. 
ADL also speaks out when government takes steps to endorse, support, or interfere with religious beliefs. These are just some of the examples of ADL's vital work in the community. I would like to express my sincere thanks to the Holocaust Museum Houston and the Asia Society of Texas Center for including ADL on this incredible panel to discuss these important and relevant issues that we face. And I applaud all of you for participating in this very, very worthwhile discussion. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Um, my name is Trisha Pagilio. I work for the American Civil Liberties Union of Texas. Uh, we're a national organization. We have offices in all 50 states and Puerto Rico. Um, in our state affiliate, which I work for, um, we focus mainly on reproductive rights, immigrants' rights, LGBT equality, and criminal justice reform. Uh, but overall, or, our organization is focused on protecting and expanding the civil liberties that are protected in the Constitution. Uh, some of our recent work in Houston, uh, in coalition with many other organizations, includes um, successfully getting 287G repealed here in Harris County, the agreement that allowed local law enforcement to actually act as immigration enforcement in our jail. Um, stopping privatization of Houston's disciplinary program for students so that we can help sort of instruct and put it into the school to prison pipeline. And then also, just last week, um, our city council introduced and unfortunately passed two additional ordinances criminalizing homelessness. Um, it turned out against those ordinances, they passed anyway. Um, but that means our work is in the beginning, so we're going to be um, turning out at homeless encampments here in Houston distributing information about um, what the limits are on police conduct enforcing these ordinances, and then monitoring them to make sure they are enforced constitutionally. So that's just um, some ways that our work impacts the Houston area. Good evening. My name is Dallas Jones. I'm the first vice president of the Houston branch of the NAACP, for those of you that are not familiar. Um, the NAACP is the National Association for the advancement of colored people. Um, however, before I continue, I would be remiss if I didn't also recognize our past president of the Houston NACP and our United States Congressman, Congressman Al Green, who is here with us this evening. Um, the NACP is the oldest and boldest, largest and baddest civil rights organization in this country. Uh, founded in 1909 in what people often don't know was a group of white activists, um, in addition to one African American, in that being Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, here in Houston, we were founded in 1918, um, so not 1929. Uh, <laughs> for us, 1918 here in Houston, and have been doing the, the work um, of social justice ever since. Um, the NACP um, is about all people. Um, the, the big misnomer is that, you know, we're just, we're, we're only about African Americans. Well, the truth of the matter is uh, the bulk of our membership is African American, but we advocate for all people. Um, one of the biggest things that, frankly, you know, we stepped out on here uh, in Houston was around the, the Equal Rights Ordinance when that was a big conversation. Um, the NAACP thought it fit then um, to stand up um, and, and, and promote an ordinance that was about uh, creating a, a, a better city for all of us, um, even though it wasn't the most popular thing for us to do. Um, we, we have a number of programs. We, so we focus on civic engagement, uh, public education, criminal justice work, um, uh, and, and particularly, one of the programs I, I, I think is, 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 is a great program that we have is our legal redress program, which happens once a month where people can come over to our branch, right, in Third Ward on uh, 2002 Wheeler. Um, and folks can come in and visit with lawyers about um, legal issues that they have. Um, we've been at the forefront of some of the most landmark um, um, Supreme Court cases in this, in this country. Um, particularly Brown versus the Board of Education. It's important to note that those those group of, that group of lawyers led by Thurgood Marshall at the time that led to the desegregation of America and ultimately in Brown v. Board II, um, those were NAACP lawyers. Um, and so we have been engaged uh, in, in, in the work. Um, we don't plan on going anywhere. We'd love to go out of business, 
Um, but unfortunately, um, given the climate uh, of our country at this time, and certainly Congressman, you know oh so well, it does not look like we'll be going out of business um, any time soon. Um, so one of the things we're act actively pursuing, and I'll wrap it up, in the legislature, uh, you know, immediately in January, we saw a slew of, of school vandalism. You know, um, kids out on Memorial went back to school to find uh, swastikas and, and, and racial epitaphs, you know, spray painted on the schools. And this, is, this has happened more than once, um, and it is continuing to happen. So we are, we are pushing legislation in Austin currently to strengthen the penalty um, and make it even more uh, of, a, of a penalty and hate crime when you do this on the campus or any place that should be a safe place for our children. So proud to be here with you this evening. Thank you so much, all of you. So before we move forward with questions, Ian and Trisha are going to give us a quick little definition so we can understand the distinctions of human rights, civil rights, and civil liberties, if it's possible to do that in a short format. Um, so, we were talking about how this is not an easy question to answer, um, and it might not be one that has a definitive answer. Can we hear you? Is that better? Um, but, so, uh, these three terms are used interchangeably to some extent, I think because they all represent the same um, values or a similar set of core values, which I'm sure we'll be talking about much more tonight. Um, but just as a sort of broad overview, when people are talking about human rights, they're generally talking about international law and principles that countries have come together to agree on. Uh, talking about civil liberties, you might be, um, civil liberties versus civil rights could be expressing the difference between freedom from something versus a right to something. Or I think in America, what's more common is we talk about civil liberties when we talk about liberties that are protected in the Constitution. When we talk about civil rights, we're talking more about legislation that was passed during the civil rights era to expand and protect the values that are protected in the Constitution. Um, so that's kind of the, the way that I see those, those three categories, although like I said, there's certainly no definitive answer here. So that's a, this can be, when Trisha and I were talking about this earlier, we can pretty much make a whole panel discussion on these three topics. I think what Tricia did is give a really good overview of the broad brush of, of what these two, what these three topics are. I think anecdotally, if you think about these, if you think about them each being three circles, think about civil liberties, think about civil rights, and you think about human rights, there's a lot of overlap, and there's a lot that, that translates between those three areas. So I'll give a little bit, some anecdotal examples for you. So, as Trisha mentioned, say for example, human rights. Human rights, we talk about a lot of different issues that come underneath that. Whether it's, it's issues uh, of, of individuals who are being oppressed and who are in squalid conditions in their country. Uh, whether it's sex trafficking. Uh, whether it's other issues that deal with international rights or international laws. Those could be human rights, but human rights also encompass civil rights and civil liberties. If you look at civil liberties now as perhaps a bigger circle and civil rights are being a subset of that. So civil liberties uh, could include civil rights. Civil rights, as all of us have talked about here today, and as Trisha mentioned, relating to different statutes or codes. Civil rights could be discrimination. It could be First Amendment issues, dealing with religious freedom issues, or separation church-state issues. It could be re women's reproductive rights issues. It could be LGBT issues. Civil liberties, also encompasses a bit, I think, anecdotally, uh, from what many can, can suggest, is, is a bit broader. It includes those, but also might include uh, people saying surveillance could be a civil uh, liberty, or if someone could uh, argue that poverty is a civil liberty as well. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a tough question, but a lot of these issues do have some overlap, and hopefully that gives you a little bit of a framework, and thank you for the question. Sure, maybe that'll be our next panel, understanding it all, trying to. Um, so now I want to get to some of the issues that are facing you. So with regard to civil liberties, how does that affect your organizations, and how does that impact your work? Maybe we'll start with Dallas. Some of the uh, most pressing issues I think facing our community is certainly um, criminal justice reform, um, certainly improving uh, community and police relations, um, uh, public education, access to it, 
um, is still a huge issue in 2017. Um, the reality of it is, is that, you know, there are students even in our school district here in, in Houston Independent School District that are experiencing two different worlds of education. How do we normalize, the, how do we equalize rather um, the playing field and give every one of these children an opportunity? Um, how do we um, prevent uh, the, the, the uh, break the school to, to prison pipeline? How do we prevent our kids from dropping out and ending up in the criminal justice system? And then once they're in that system, how do we make sure that they're treated fairly, um, that they're given that they're given uh, um, uh, uh, just due in a, in a court of law? Um, these are still issues. These are still very very real issues. Um, and, and I think it, what you're seeing is that, you know, people, people are, 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 particularly in our community, uh, are, are frustrated um, and they're, 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 they're angry about it. And so, you know, I, interestingly, you know, I got an opportunity uh, last week, I think it was, to visit with the mother of Sandra Bland. Um, she was in Austin in the state capitol um, lobbying for legislation named after her daughter to try to help to, to uh, strengthen the relationship um, between uh, our police officers and, and, and citizens that frankly have a distrust. In 2017, if I'm pulled over in, in my car, um, I, I'm very afraid. Um, and it doesn't matter what kind of car you're in, it doesn't matter what you're wearing in that car. Um, that shouldn't be, that shouldn't be. And so we have to address these issues, um, and we're, we, we are addressing these issues and trying to work through these issues collectively with uh, uh, our elected officials and our, and our government to, to try to improve the, those conditions. That's great. Maybe we just go down, Tricia. <laughs> so I think, this, I think this question is really hard, right? There's, there, we're seeing um, scary stuff on all types of issues come out of the Texas legislature, uh, come from the current presidential administration, um, even sometimes at the local level, we're seeing really scary stuff happening. Um, so when I was thinking about this question, I thought, you know, why not just go with what's on my mind, because I was at a conference about it last week, <laughs> um, which is immigration enforcement. Um, I think there's a kind of a storm forming for us here in Texas, um, and that's immigration enforcement is going to be one of the biggest challenges that our organization and we as a community face um, for probably the next two to four years. Um, at the state level, we're seeing the governor and our state lawmakers try to force local officials to act as immigration agents um, and take away their discretion to do what's right for their communities and follow the advice of facing experts, which is to build a community trust rather than acting as immigration enforcement. At the federal level, I think we're all familiar with the rhetoric that we've seen from this presidential administration. Um, in terms of immigration enforcement priorities, um, the prior priorities under a president who the prior president had um, was deporting more people than any president ever had before. This president is um, making the enforcement priorities even, even worse, basically. Uh, we're seeing him um, really push on expanding the existence of those agreements with local law enforcement to make local police into immigration agents. Once here in Harris County, we decided to get rid of our 287G agreement, the president has come back to each county that ring around our county and asked them to enter into these agreements. Um, we're also seeing retaliatory uh, immigration rates in Austin, where the sheriff has said she's not going to hold people just on President Trump's immigration officer's request. Um, with increased immigration enforcement, we're going to see increased immigration detention. A third of the immigration detention beds in our country are made here in Texas. Um, many of them are in private facilities, and the conditions in these facilities are really atrocious. Um, so I think overall, doing what we can to fight the increased immigration enforcement is going to be one of the biggest challenges that our community faces in the next two to four years. So when you deal with some of the issues that, that I just mentioned, uh, from our perspective, certainly we have a lot of priorities at ADL. I'm a lay leader and we have a number of staff here in the country and, and uh, 
we, we have the national and international reach as well. And we're very concerned, I guess, if I want to focus on certain particular issues uh, dealing with civil liberties, we're very, very concerned about the uptick in hate and the uptick in anti-Semitism. And uh, I think, of course, Dallas touched on it with, uh, with swastikas being drawn. But what we do is, is we look at, uh, we're instructed and guided by over 100 years of policies that we have relating to the various issues, and some of which I touched on earlier. And what we do is, is we use those policies to go ahead and work on legislation, whether it's forming model, uh, model legislation, such as the James Virginia Matthew Shepard Hate Crimes Act, or whether it's working with legislators, working with wonderful people like Congressman Green and our elected officials, and working with law enforcement as well. We have to look at this from a multifaceted approach. And I think that it brings me back to the civil liberties question, and that is, when you're looking at this issue, their civil liberties cover such a large, large gamut of different issues. And what we try to do is, is either speak out on something directly and take, a, take our unique voice to that issue. We convene and have a coalition, uh, we convene coalitions with many of these groups here that you see here today, uh, these wonderful organizations, or we'll go ahead and partner with an organization if the organization takes a lead on, on those particular issues. But circling back to the original point, and that is that's concerning us here in the community, among many things going on, is that we've seen since November, we've seen literally double the number of hate incidents and anti-Semitic incidents in our community than we had in the prior 12 months combined. We're talking about four or five months. So that is a great concern. It ranges and runs the gamut from anti-Semitic slurs to conduct in schools, to conduct in the community, to neo-Nazi and, and white supremacist flyers, which talk about Jews and Muslims and others getting out, getting out of here and quote unquote, uh, just go, come back, go back to where you came from. We're talking about uh, people doing uh, in public displays of Sikh uh, Heil, to Heil Hitler salute. We're talking about uh, anti-gay and anti-Muslim uh, slurs. We're talking about racist slurs. We're talking about all sorts of these activities that are going on that we, we coordinate, we get information on, and then we try to work with our elected officials, we work with our law enforcement, and we work with our community leaders and our schools to be able to ensure that people are educated, but also to ensure that we confront it, combat it, and deal effectively with these issues. That's just one of many things that, uh, that I think there's a challenge that, that we're dealing with in, in this respect. Um, speaking for our national JCL office, um, I think two of the issues that most concern us going forward um, includes uh, the hate crimes issue um, that Ian just mentioned. Um, one of the things that we would absolutely uh, you know, do uh, in working and uh, collaborating with all of uh, these wonderful organizations is to try to um, fight hate crime on you know every level, local, uh, state, national, and um, you know one of the good examples that I can think of is uh, just um, several months ago, the Indian, uh, the South Asian Indian gentleman uh, in Kansas uh, was uh, killed, um, and that was a case of uh, misidentity. The perpetrator, um, you know, was vengeful towards. Uh, Muslim Americans or you know, people who he thought was quote unquote our enemy. Uh, we have cases like that, um, you know, going back really um, since the first days Asian Americans came to the United States, uh, starting with the Chinese Americans in the 1940s and the Japanese Americans in the 1880s and then the Filipino Americans. Um, so we as an organization would absolutely do the best that we can to fight um, hate crime. Uh, one of the things that concerns me on a personal level is when you look at what happened in the 1980s with, at the height of the, um, really the Japan bashing period, you know, when the Japanese automotive industry was um, growing at paces to, really to outpace the American automotive industry in Detroit. And we had that very unfortunate incident where a gentleman of uh, Chinese ancestry named Vincent Chen was brutally murdered. Uh, with baseball bats. 
1982. And that, again, was a case of mistaken identity. Um, to the perpetrators, he looked Asian, and therefore he must have been Japanese. Um, in the late 80s, when really we had some really um, unfortunate incidents even at our state capitol, where some congressmen were taking um, sledgehammers to actually break a Toshiba stereo cassette recorder for a photo op. And that was just perpetuating the fear of uh, you know, Japan overtaking the United States and that whole yellow peril um, feeling. So uh, we're always going to be on the lookout for that, and we'll, we will comment that. The second issue that we are most concerned about is the Muslim ban and the talk of uh, creating a Muslim registry. Um, as I mentioned in my introduction, um, you know, our, the legacy, the sad legacy of our Japanese American community is that collectively we were all put into camps during World War II. And that was not, uh, no, you know, there was no other reason than this, uh, this our skin color. Um, so we were absolutely and vehemently uh, combat any um, efforts to create a registry for any uh, ethnic group, religious group, uh, minority, um, and uh, we were certainly pursue that uh, in the courts and um, obviously you know through our social, um, you know, variety of social channels. But uh, that's something that really concerns us, concerns us especially after 9/11 uh, uh, in 2001, uh, September 12th. Uh, the day after 9-11 happened, uh, our former national director, John Kibeshi of the JACL, was the first uh, to actually call a national press conference to give fair warning to the U.S. government uh, that they should not even think about rounding up Arab Americans or Muslim Americans. Um, because obviously, you know, we, our community, could testify to the devastating effects of that. And obviously, it would be unlawful, uh, how unlawful and unconstitutional it was. So, um, you know, I, I absolutely, here at the local level, I'd be more than happy to continue to work with uh, my esteemed colleagues, colleagues here in finding any kind of bigotry and uh, prejudice. Thank you. That's great. All right. Okay, I'm next. No, I'm fine. No. So, at Emerge USA, what we're trying you to do speak. The Emerge USA, what we're trying to do is how do we make Houston a place where there is not hate? And when I say hate, um, try to be more proactive as opposed to reactive. Because as a community, I think that's what we've been doing so far. And so we need to start thinking maybe 10 steps ahead. And um, so some of the work that we do is trying to reach out to allies so that when something happens, we have those friends already in place that are going to stand with us. So for example, the Muslim ban. That was something very personal to us, and it was really upsetting. But to see the entire community come out and say that this was wrong was uplifting, and it gave us hope. And so the hope is that if something happens later, who is going to be with us? Because the Muslim ban isn't going to come into place right now. The, the courts slide away. But statistically speaking, not that I know anything, there will probably be some terrorist attack in the next four years. And what's going to happen then? Because when the Muslim ban comes after a terrorist attack, that's when the ramifications of those type of orders really come into play. So we need to make sure that we have all those um, arguments, defenses, place before that. We've seen the fallout of, of, of what happens when we have a presidential campaign that is based on um, a lot of heated rhetoric. Um, Muslims are being bullied at a rate that we have just haven't seen before, even after 9-11. Um, over a half of Muslim parents report that their children have been bullied. Uh, we know that crimes have spiked, the FBI has reported that crimes have spiked to about 67% since 2015. So we've seen an increase from 2015 to 2016 of 67% uh, of the hate crimes. And that's just hate crimes, right? So the hate crimes cover is a really defined legal definition. But there's also a lot of hate incidents, right? What happens when someone talks to you or, 
or treats you in a certain way, maybe you can say anything, but you know what they're implying or what they're meaning in their actions, right? What happens to you when someone doesn't serve you in a restaurant? What happens when you are um, overlooked when you're trying to get in line for, for, for purchasing an item? So these are all things that we need to start corralling and getting the data on and, and start working so that we can start talking about these issues and having some real concrete data underneath us. Um, so for us, civil liberties looks like how do we play, make Houston a more safer place and a, more, a place where everyone is comfortable and free. Thank you. The biggest challenge to our organization, and I believe to all the other organizations up here, is the, uh, the barrage of, of hate rhetoric that was unleashed uh, during the campaign and subsequent uh, election of uh, Donald Trump. It has unleashed a, a great deal of hate. I think it has validated some of the prejudices out there of people that hate uh, immigrants or think they hate them, uh, xenophobes or anybody that, uh, that has no understanding of uh, what immigrants are, are about and uh, consequently feels empowered, empowered to, to be hateful, empowered to take it out on somebody that's, that's not their skin color. Uh, case in point, we're seeing it every day, uh, United uh, Airlines, we saw what that man was dragged out and and beaten, and uh, I wonder if he would have been the same if he was white. Today, just before I came here, I was watching the news, and again, United was on the news. This time, this uh, I believe it's like a Hispanic man. He has his little granddaughter, and she happened to be white-skinned. He's dark. Well, some, some lady there pointed him out uh, to security, said uh, possible kidnapping. So he took the man out, and uh, aggressive uh, questioning, and they wouldn't believe it, and all that, you know, un until, you know, he finally proved that he was his, his daughter. He married to, to his wife, his light skin, and uh, so, you know, so, you know, that makes us worry. You know, we worry all the time. I, I have grandchildren that are lighter skin than I am, green eyes, whatever. You know, but that's, uh, you know, that's part of America. You know, we come in different colors and all that. But you know, we, we feel that uh, highly discriminated on, we feel like second class citizens when, uh, when there's that uh, environment out there that has been unleashed. And you see it even you know, with, with uh, laws that are designed to strip away uh, our rights, like the 287G that uh, someone mentioned and that uh, we have chosen not to enforce it here, but now the legislature is trying to uh, come up with other uh, more uh, stricter laws, like SB4, uh, which that one mandates, mandates that law enforcement uh, 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 question you regarding your immigration status and, and perhaps arrest you, it mandates police officers, uh, whether it's sheriffs, whether it's uh, city police, whether it's a uh, campus police, and even hospitals, if you go to the hospital and you know they, they can question you there. If, if you're uh, not a uh, documented immigrant, then you can be taken away from the hospital. What's that going to do for people that, that, that are sick? You have a situation where people are afraid, literally afraid to go to supermarkets, afraid to, to go to health care, because this kind of thing is happening. It's happening all over the country, not just here, up, up north, uh, all over. And, and so, uh, you know, there's a great deal of, of fear about, amongst the immigrant community, and, and not just the immigrant community. If you're not, uh, you know, lily white, and you're dark, and you board a plane, you always worry. That's happened to me before. I've been sitting down with uh, four other people, and they take me to ask me for my papers. You know, this kind of thing. And so this is a thing that we, as an organization, is addressing, and, uh, I hope that we all address it and everybody here uh, addresses it because it, this is uh, very hurtful and harmful for our country because we're a country of immigrants and we cannot be divided. We have to be together. Thank you, Mary. I think it's a privilege of sitting at the end of the table. 
Um, and I used to be a teacher. I still am a teacher, actually. I want to do something, a teacher thing with you. And I'll ask you to pick up your flyer that you received when you came into your program. And I'm going to read you what it says at the very top of this. Because there's been an interesting echo of a word that has come through um, most of the speakers as it's worked, you know, the discussion has worked its way to me. Um, and on the top of this program is a logo that we are using now. And it says, hope is greater than hate. Which is a very, very, very important thing, I think, for us to think about tonight. Um, I'm, I'm fascinated to be on this panel with these distinguished organizations. We're the baby in the group. Is there somebody in the audience that can tell me what year Holocaust Museum Houston started? I know there is. Okay, got together, started to work on that. When did the museum open? started working. 96. 98. 98. So, that's not 1929, it's not 1919, not 1910. It's very, very recent, um, 20 years. Um, in that 20 years, the challenges in our community, I think, have um, exacerbated themselves and grown in dimensions um, where I, I use the words a myriad of hatred when I spoke in the beginning, and I am so taken by the rhetoric of hate that has become so much a part of how the people in our country talk to each other. It is, I think, appalling. Um, one of the things that's unique about Holocaust Museum Houston on this panel tonight is that we have a home. We have a place, a physical place where people come. Um, and our job in that physical um, space and place is to educate about the Holocaust, to remember our survivors, to think about the things that happened in the past and what our role is in bringing that history forward to a way that it changes the way we act as individuals in today's world. Um, you know, the thing that's striking to me right now in the millions of people that we've seen since the museum have opened is the questions that people come with, um, the needs that people have. I think we live in a time right now that is unparalleled in, its, um, in the important essential questions we need to ask each other about who we are as human beings, what our responsibilities are, and to whom. We talk about something called the universe of obligation. Is there anybody in the audience that's ever heard of that terminology? Some of the educators that are out there tonight know it. It's a, it's a concept that came from the 70s by a sociologist named Helen Fine, who talked about where do we exist in the world and to whom are we obligated? Who are we responsible to, to, to doing something for them, to helping them? Every one of our organizations deals with that question. Um, I, I, I'm going to just now go real simple. I think we live in a time when so many people are terribly afraid. They do not know, they do not trust, oftentimes, in their um, political leaders. Other, other people are thrilled with what's going on. We, we received a really interesting letter um, or an email in our museum two days ago from a gentleman who had come to the museum and seen an exhibit that we think is amazing and wonderful and so important in our community. And it's about the Braceros movement, um, which was a worker program that brought farm workers to the United States and didn't treat them very well. Um, and it, it's our first bilingual Spanish-English exhibit, so that's very important in our community. Um, we're in a position right now where we're trying to figure out how to be a home, how to be a welcoming space in this community, which is the most diverse community in the United States right now. Um, Dr. Kleinberg, who's done the study that established that statistic, says that we have 13 years in Houston to set an example for the rest of the world about how to behave. He doesn't say behave, that's how I interpret what he's saying. How, you know, what should we be doing in our communities to conduct ourselves in ways that are helpful? Um, and, and that's the kind of thing that we at the museum are trying to think about. 
And I think that's the greatest challenge. How do you figure out what you need to do to welcome people um, to your space? We need to be a space that's open. We're also a 501c3. So who in the audience knows what the challenges are of being a 501c3 in the current um, climate in which we live? Because in a 501c3, you can lose your tax status if you inappropriately, according to government regulations, um, speak about politics, speak about government. Um, and that's, I think that's a great challenge. So our greatest challenge right now is figuring how, I think, to um, talk the talk that is necessary to honor our survivors. And we have um, at least one survivor in the audience tonight. I can't really see everybody. Um, and and the honoring our survivors is, for me, about the future. And it's about carrying on the legacy of care that has to exist in the world for people to be looked out for, for us to grow more upstanders, people that will stand up and do what's right for others around them. So I would like to end on that note and ask you all to be hopeful to figure out ways to counter the hate that you are hearing and seeing um, in our community. This is, as Ian said, we are involved in lots of work right now about how to help stop these hate incidents that are happening in our public schools and our community settings. So we need your help. Well, that's a perfect segue for the next question. We're getting some terrific audience questions, so we want to move to those in just a minute. But we want to connect that with this one. Where do you need the most help, and how can everybody help you? What are the kind of partnerships that you need in your organizations that everyone could lend a hand? I mean, really, what are the solutions to some of these challenges that we can all help you with? And unfortunately, we won't be able to hear from everybody down the line. I wish we had hours to have this panel discussion, but maybe we could take you know, two of you, and then we'll go to the audience questions and we get strongly about this. Thing. So I, I, I'm actually encouraged by this dialogue. Um, and, and, and being able to bring groups like this together to, to really uh, begin to talk about working collaboratively and to ask the questions such as how can we how can we help each other? Look, you know, we we have heard a lot tonight. I think many of us are probably ready to jump out of the window because we've had to reflect uh, about how things are really going wrong right now in this country. You know, it's important. That, so I'll say a couple of rays of hope here, right, since I'm looking at this, this, this hope logo, um, the lovely logo, by the way, uh, on, on, on my program. Um, but we have to realize that there was just a majority, overwhelmingly, of people in this country that felt disconnected from the country over the last eight years. Um, we, we saw tremendous progress under President Obama, um, at least from my perspective, and probably from a, a number of the perspectives of people in this room. Um, and a lot of people didn't feel connected to that. Um, and I think that disconnect is how we ended up where we are. Um, the whole whole part is, for those of us that are here, we live in uh, the greatest city in this, in, in this nation. Uh, we live in a diverse city, uh, we live in a tolerant city, and so the conversation about how we can work together and help each other to make our city better is not just some talking point or kind of pipe dream. It's possible. Um, that is Houston, um, you know, because you're right, there, there, there are attempts to, to enforce the, the, you know, change the immigration laws and, and make our, uh, you know, police force become uh, uh, you know, essentially, you know, uh, federal immigration workers. But I'm here said not in this city, um, not while I'm here. And so I think that's, that's encouraging for us. And so I think continuing these types of dialogue, um, but also taking that dialogue and turning it into action, um, understanding and appreciating our interconnectivities, right? Um, if there's a Muslim ban in this country, there's a ban on all of us in this country. Because you start today with, with, with our Muslim brothers and sisters, and you end tomorrow uh, with another uh, group. It is unfortunate that people always find a way um, to make
make someone the punching bag of the day. And certainly our community has experienced it, from slavery to Jim Crow to where we are today. Um, so working together, supporting each other, and, and really keeping this dialogue moving from words to action, um, and inviting other people to the table, I, I think is a great way for us to begin. I think the dualism of our mission to stop the defamation of the Jewish people and to secure justice and fair treatment for all is, is particularly helpful here. Because we recognize early on that for us to also be for our Jewish community, we have to be for others as well. It's not just because it's right. It's because we're all in it together. And I think you get that sense here tonight. And when you pick that up in terms of how you're going to engage, You've seen, and we've talked about it a little bit uh, before, this, uh, before this panel discussion, about how people are getting engaged, how people are building bridges, how people are connecting on the individual level, how people are connecting on the community level. You can advocate, like we do, when it's either legal advocacy or legislative advocacy, but connecting, but also being out there to have your voice heard, because it's important to have your voice heard. So, to give some, some examples of what you can do. What we're doing with ADL is online, if you do hashtag expose hate, you can report hate all over the country. And we're taking track, we're keeping track of all of it, we're responding to it, we're dealing with it, we're dealing with community officials, and we're working on it to, to address all these issues to create solutions. You can try to connect up uh, on, on ours, for example, or I'm sure any of these organizations. We have websites, we have local reports and blogs that come out that you can sign up for. Particularly here, you can call our local office, I'm sure all the other groups have local offices here as well. But it's important to get out there and have your voice heard. We have, as I'm sure a lot of other organizations here, action alerts. Look for the action alerts, sign up for those. Those action alerts usually come with pre-prepared letters to, to your members of Congress, to your senators, to, on the federal level to your state legislators, perhaps on the local level. And they alert you to things that are going on, to issues that are going on in your community that you can have, lend yourself, lend your voice to. And then what happens is when you get that action alert, you can lend your name to that, and a particular communication will go out to that member of Congress, to that senator, to the state legislative official or other elected official. So you can be active. You can reach across the aisle and talk to all sorts of people from all different perspectives that you can have. In terms, whether it's ethnic perspective, religious religious beliefs, I'm sorry, ethnic or religious beliefs, like we have in our coalition for mutual, mutual respect, and it's building those bridges of dialogue and having, as Dallas mentioned, this civil discourse and dialogue that makes us a great community in Houston to hopefully be a shining beacon for the rest of the country as well. But that all starts with you, and that's the hope. I think that that's the nice message of the Holocaust Museum has created here on the program. The hope is in you, in being able to help organizations like us, but also in being able to influence your, your dialogue, the discussion, and influence events locally and around the country. Okay, Neil, I know you want to say, and then we're going to take audience questions because they're mounting up. Um, the only thing I was going to say is, it's very overwhelming right now, right? So there's like a lot going on. Everything is coming at you full speed, full throttle. And a part of me, anyways, wants to do everything, and I want to save education, I want to save the refugees, and I certainly don't want my Muslims being banned, and I'm going to save the world. But that can get very, very tiring, and it can cause um, a lot of fatigue. And, and, and there's a lot of work that needs to be done. So my only advice would be to find one issue, one issue that you feel very strongly on. So for me, Partly because it's my work, it's anti-Muslim hate. But whatever it is, make that your issue. And then once you find that issue, work on it. But you, there has to be some sort of um, being able to take on only what you can do. But if everyone was to do that, then we can really make a difference. Um, the only other thing I was going to say is crossing the line. I think that's so important. We need to cross the line. Cross the line, meet people that are different from us. Um, people that are on the other side of the aisle, like someone mentioned. Um, talk to people. Uh, we found that um, 
people have a really bad perception of American Muslims. It's been documented. The statistics bear this out. People don't like us. But when we ask those same people, have you met a Muslim? The statistics all of a sudden really lower. And so that tells us that, or at least my community, that what we have to do is just go out and meet people. So we have to talk to people. And so for me, it's about crossing the line, getting comfortable with a lot of people that I probably wouldn't be comfortable with. And I think that goes a long way in making change. Thank you. Perfect. We're going to have to move on to some audience questions here because we're going to run out of time. But here's one I love. Policy and legislation change is one avenue to protecting civil rights and civil liberties. But how do we move to changing hearts? Mm -hmm. How do we change minds? Not only to build solidarity, uh, to build solidarity among all our marginal communities. How do you change people's minds? And I'm giving this one to Mary Lee because I've heard you answer this before. How do you change people's hearts and minds? Okay, so I've been sitting up here thinking I want to extend every single one of you a personal invitation to come to the Holocaust Museum, Holocaust Museum in Houston, 5401 Carolyn Street. And I'm going to challenge you to do something that will be challenging. I want you to go through the museum to the, the back door which goes to the garden and I want you to go out and turn to the right and walk up the pathway. Along the pathway you will see um, quotes from Houston survivors and, and then other famous people in the Holocaust um, who had the Holocaust experience that talk about what it was like to be on a rail car being deported. My challenge to you is I want you to go I want you to stand between two transportation artifacts that we have. And I want you to pose to yourself the question, what would I have done? And the two artifacts that I'm talking about, one is a German era rail car, um, and we say because we're not positive it was used to transport people, but we're pretty darn sure it was. Um, and this was used to take people from their homes, from ghettos, and deport them often to killing centers or the slave labor camps to move them again and again. Um, right across from that is an, an artifact of the opposite variety, and it is a boat um, used in the Danish rescue. Um, and I want you to stand there. It's one of the most significant places, I think, in our city to think about what you are and who you are and how you make decisions. So that's my invitation to you. Right. But it's education, that's what I've heard you say before. Yeah, it, it is. It is education. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Does anybody else want to speak to this one and how we can change some hearts and minds? Gary? So um, I would also like to, I guess, ask for everyone's help and also challenge everybody. Um, you know, first, uh, please keep an open mind, as Nimala said. You know, if you, if you don't have friends in other ethnic communities or religious communities, you know, take a chance, go out and try to meet somebody from that community. You know, get to know them. Um, you might become fast friends or even best friends in the future, right? Unless we have these personal connections, we're never going to, you know, change our communities. Um, shortly after the presidential elections, I was, you know, I'm not going to mention tenants names or politicians names, but I was panicked. And so I reached out to my good friends at the Holocaust meeting, Mary and Emily, and asked them, can we do something? Can we have some kind of discussion, some kind of forum? And uh, the result was this. You know, it took many months, uh, but we're finally here. So I'm hoping that you know, this is only the beginning of a very productive uh, conversation that all of us can have. Not just these, you know, the seven or eight groups that are here, but much, much larger, you know, um, group of uh, representatives from all kinds of ethnic communities and religious communities. There's, in Washington, D.C., back in 1950, there was an organization uh, that was founded uh, called the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights. Now it's the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights and Human Rights. JCL National, along with ADL, and OCP, and I believe LULAC too, were uh, four of the original three founding uh, organizations of that, that uh, coalition. Now, I believe there's over 200. 
you know, we have to do something like that here in the city of Houston and also throughout the state. Because if we don't get to know each other, if we don't go out and socialize and break bread, you know, how are we going to get along with each other, right? So I really think that every one of us, we should try our best to go in and meet somebody that we might not know that well, and, uh, you know, we can start changing our community as well. Thank you. So how about this question? How do we balance civil liberties with national security? Given the rise of extremism and international system, international system of terrorism around the world, blurring combat lines, how do we find the balance? How do we find this balance without repeating the past? Who wants to chime in on this one? <laughs> So, you know, we keep joking about how um, many of the organizations at this table were founded around the same time. Um, maybe a, many of them were founded in, in wartime, either immediately before or immediately after World War I, um, because our country was struggling so much with this very question at that time. Um, I think it is a false choice to say that we can't have security if we don't give up our liberties. Um, and I think that you're all here because you recognize that. Um, our country faces very difficult policy choices, not just in the area of national security, but in the areas that we've talked about tonight. Uh, hate speech, right, is another difficult one that our organization has struggled with. Um, crime, right, is another place where we could say we can sacrifice civil liberties in order to get a little bit more public safety. Um, there's always going to be legitimate governmental objectives that the government can point to and say, look, we have to deal with this impossible policy situation. And I think the answer for a person who's a sort of a staunch defender of civil liberties is to say, okay, you're right, we need to be really creative about this serious policy problem, but the Constitution sets a baseline. We have agreed that there's a sort of ground rules here about what the government can and can't do. And no matter how difficult the policy choices that we're facing, these are things that we can never give up. Otherwise, we're sacrificing who we are as a country. So that's not saying that the policy issues are um, not serious. They are. But at the end of the day, this is what makes us America, the Constitution. And that's what I think we have to do. I think you hit it on the head, right? Our values shouldn't change. Our values shouldn't change. Uh, I think regardless of the, the, the threats that we will face as a country, I think we've always, national security has always been an issue. Um, and, and I think we have to learn how to make those values consistent, right? I'm, 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 you know, I'm, almost, I'm always baffled by, you know, the folks that are, you know, pro-life, which is fine. I think we all are. But then at the same time, it's pro-capital punishment. Right? There's some consistency there, in my mind anyways, right? Because we're, we're, one way or the other, we're taking a line. And so I think, I think if we can, can find that consistency, um, I, I think we wouldn't have to answer questions like, how do we balance our civil liberties? And this is what we're about. This is, this is supposed to be the baseline of who we are as a country. This, this is what makes us the shining example for the rest of the world. So when do we decide that we're just not going to be that? Okay, so now I would like to talk education. Because what if we started to ask our citizens in our country and the people that live in our country this question when they were in kindergarten? And then we continue to ask them every year. And they grew up thinking about these really important concepts. And um, I can tell you from experience that very young children if they were in charge of the world, it might be a much more peaceful place. Um, if they're given the opportunity to keep those thoughts and thought patterns um, in their head, and this is going to demand change in the way we do educate people right now, because there's not a lot of time for real thoughtful work like that in schools. So one of the things that I dream about as I try to think about what the future can be like is how to return to the young people in our country 
the freedom of thought that they need to grow up to be able to answer this kind of question in a civil, thoughtful, respectful of our government and respectful of our the challenges that we face in this balance. So, you have young kids in school and you want to march on the school tomorrow and tell them this? That'd be cool. <laughs> well, here's a really long question from some students, as high school students who attend school in the same district that the memorial incident took place. We want to thank you all for being here and discussing these issues. As Asian Americans, you, as Asian American youth, we have experienced difficulties and witnessed our fellow students of all groups be affected. Our generation will be shaped by these societal trends, societal trends and must take ownership of the reality that youth are not only affected by hate, but are committing hate. How are your organizations reaching out to our generation? Well, I will say that the NAACP, Youth and College Division, was founded in 1936. Um, I, I am an NAACP uh, I got first involved in college uh, and stay, have stayed active over the years. I've, I've served as national staff member, uh, a regional director. And I, I say that because we are trying to educate our kids early. Uh, to be freedom fighters um, and to to be vigilant on their respective campuses. You know, I almost got kicked out of school. I probably took it too far. But <laughs> but the reality of it is that's what we are trying to instill. Um, and so we have youth councils. Uh, we have a youth council here in Houston. Um, all of our branches pretty much have youth councils in addition to our college chapters. Uh, and and our and our and we even hit young adults as well. And so we're trying to make sure. My daughter has a membership to the NAACP. She's three. Um, so <laughs> we're trying to make sure that people are, that we are, we're cultivating within our kids to stand up and, and be a voice on their respective campuses. Yeah. Um, at Emerge USA, actually this weekend, we're doing our third cohort of emerging leaders. And what our emerging leaders do is we try to instill in them um, the, the skills that they need to be the next generation of ethical and qualified leaders. And we have people, we have people coming in from the ACLU coming to talk to them. Um, we, we take them through kind of this journey of how to become that social justice warrior that Dallas was, uh, Dallas was mentioning. We want that in our young people. And so these are college-age students. They go through a retreat here in Houston. We talk about the basics of leadership. We take them to Austin. We then have them meet elected officials over at the Capitol. And then the past two years, we have taken them to Turkey. And then last year, we went to South Africa. And this year, again, we're going to go to South Africa. And we meet people who have gone through this. Now, we went last year to Afri South Africa, and everyone's like, what's going on in America? And we're like, oh, it's nothing for the past few days. It's just going to be over. And it's kind of like a bad virus. You just got to get out of your system. It didn't get out of the system. So that's fine. We have to we have to deal with that reality, and and so we meet people that have gone through apartheid. I think I have that. We think we have that. People had it really bad in South Africa. It was it was a systemic a systemic uh, form of racism that Im imbued every single part of, of life for that community, and yet they were able to rise out of it, and they're still struggling, but they were able to do it in a way that is that offers some lessons to us in terms of how we can deal with that. Um, so we have our, our students meet people that went through the apartheid system. Um, we have people that were Muslims just like them, and they stood on the side of, of what was right. And they were part of hunger strikes. They were in Robben Island with Nelson Mandela. And it's inspiring. Um, so those are some of the things that we're doing with our young people to make sure that we have those leaders available now that will be able to represent us into the future. So we have, um, at ADL, we have a number of different education uh, type opportunities that, uh, that we've rolled out for different schools all across the country, and that's called New Place for Hate. We've also had early childhood education, and I think it's really important that you as high school students, wherever you are in the audience, um, that you, you speak out, but you understand how to do that in a smart way, and learning that, and learning that, that takes time because oftentimes there's a lot of peer pressure involved. So we strongly believe that education is a, is a critical component 
in the fight against discrimination, the fight against anti-Semitism. Doing that requires a partnership with the schools, which we have. The schools for educators to, to work to bias. And our educators are doing such a great job of that, and they do it on a daily basis. But it's also important moving forward from that, moving forward from the K through 12 and moving up. We're dealing with, uh, we have also to deal with anti-Semitism, we have words to action program going forward into college and also in high school, where there are different videos, different training and curricula that are used to be able to show students how to address and deal in a smart way, an appropriate way to deal with fighting discrimination and anti-Semitism so that students are armed with that knowledge. Because curriculum that comes through in strategic partnerships and it's important that everyone knows that their educators are there to support them in that endeavor. That from my own personal perspective. But education is important from day one. And you educate on the ignorance, and then hopefully you can be able to show individuals why that is offensive. If you find something offensive at your school, you have to understand how you convey that to the other individual and say, this is offensive to me, and here's why. Maybe they didn't understand. Leave yourself that room for that possibility that maybe they just didn't know. So that's a critical step, I think, in the education process. I've been told we have time for one more question. And this is an interesting one to end on. How do you keep your spirits up when the volume of hate crimes and violations is so Are there ever times you want to give up? How do you all keep fighting the fight? And thank you for doing so. Answer the last question, so I'm going to be really strategic and segue these two things. So, um, the way we talk about this all the time, we all work in worlds that are dark, that have troubling histories. Um, and when we think about the decisions that human beings have made, maybe sometimes we just want to leave humanity because it's so dire. But um, one of the things that we've started this year at the Holocaust Museum is a really powerful program, um, an educational program for high school students, grades 9 through 12, and it is called Engines of Change. Um, this program came about because one of our board members brought her teenage son to the Holocaust Museum a few years ago, and he said, Mom, please don't ever bring me here again. This is too sad, too depressing. And she went away from that very disconcerted. And with the dream of creating something at the Holocaust Museum, that would be hopeful for young people. And this Engines of Change program that my colleagues Emily and Michelle and Lori have been working um, on all this past year is a program that meets every, one Sunday a month for 10 months of the year. Um, and we uh, have a group of 39 students that somebody was in the room last week, or a couple weeks ago, when Mayor Turner spoke to the group, and they said, this looks like the United Nations, because it is such a diverse group of, that represents our city, socioeconomic classes, um, ethnicity, religious beliefs, um, political differences in thinking, and these young people come together, and they have, over the years, 
um, you know, we've been talking a lot about the rhetoric of hate, how that's affecting them. There are children in the group who um, are concerned on a daily basis about their families being deported. Um, it's a place where they can come and be real, where we structure for them ways to have civil discussions with each other. And it's been an amazing and wonderful experience, as we've heard tonight about meeting others. Because you can't really know or understand another person until you know them. And that's where it all starts. And so we're hoping that this program will become, we're in a pilot, we'll do another pilot next year, and then it'll be something that we make broadly available to the rest of the country. We've already had many requests from people how to replicate this in their areas, and so we're looking forward to doing that. And now I'm going to try to pull some of our colleagues up here into that as we uh, go into the next year. So if you know young people, go to the Holocaust Museum website, look up Engines of Change. Uh, the applications are due May 31st, Henry? May 31st. And it's going to be tight application process unless we can replicate our capacity and have like six groups of educators instead of one. I don't know about that. But anyway, it's a, it's a great thing for the kids. Anybody in the audience tonight? I It's all grassroots, all volunteer. And uh, so, you know, it's easy to get burned because it's a lot of work. Yes. And uh, she doesn't know how to uh, read English or Spanish. So they got her to sign a form that read that uh, they could keep the child until she's 18 years of age. Uh, satisfactorily. And uh, so we finally got her, uh, we did a press conference and made a press about And uh, that Keeps me going is to see the that different people have different buttons, so yeah. how, how can you not? When I look at the the progress of particularly African Americans in this country. And I look at uh, the people that have marched and died and been bitten by dogs and went to jail and been lynched. And when you look at that, how do you not, uh, I'm a fairly young person, how do you not pick up the mantle and recognize? Because let's be clear, here's what I know about my generation and below. A lot of us are not picking up. And so, in order to move the ball forward, you know, the only thing necessary for evil to try to promote good is for good men to do nothing. And so, as a result, you know, how can I not pick up the baton and try to run with it from, 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 from folks like Matthew Adams or, or Dr. King or you know, Congressman Green, who, who led this branch for, for so long, right? There has to be a new generation. That, and again, that's something I learned at the end of LACP. Um, as a college student, uh, that it is my, it is my obligation, it is, it is our obligation as an organization 
um, to be to be a conscience. Uh, we believe the conscience of this country. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for. I hope this is the first of many conversations. Just like you said, Dallas, like we can get together again. I feel like we've only touched the tip of the ice park. But can we give our panelists a round of applause? Museum Houston uh, for hosting us and the Asia Society for their support. Can we give them a round of applause? And thank you to all of you for coming out. Thank you for caring. And we hope to continue this conversation and keep the conversation going amongst yourselves and everybody you know. Thank you so much for coming.